Ready? Uh, Welcome to the great event. This year in spring, we are going to have a tall tales contest. So today we are going to learn how to write a tall tale and what is a tall tale. We have an exciting lineup of speakers. We are going to start with Yana. Yana Lannan is a beautiful young woman with incredible skills as a speaker and a storyteller. She's a two-time finalist in the District 57 International Speech Contest. She's here to keep these wild Irishmen and a woman in check. Yana, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. Welcome everyone tonight. I am going to share my presentation with you. Okay, can you please give me thumbs up that you can see it? Yes. Excellent. Welcome, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Tonight we met here to learn something interesting. We know that the best way to learn is through entertainment. And that's why we came here to District 101 to the Tall Tale Workshop, so that way we can not only entertain you, but also enlighten you to learn how to prepare and how to deliver a successful Tall Tale. I would like to introduce our trainers tonight. So my name is Jana Lennon. Uh, I, am, I came here a long way from the Czech Republic. And tonight I am going to have a help of four absolutely amazing and incredible trainers, Evelyn Lee, Declan Shelby, Brandon James Murphy, and Dennis Dawson. We have an amazing agenda for you. The first will be the joy of judging. Who doesn't like to judge? Well, tonight we are going to teach you how to judge a tall tale. And please pay close attention because you will be judging our trainers. After I explain the judging rules, our trainers will give you tall tale samples and explain to you how did they decide to have this tall tale and what kind of insights they can share so that way you can deliver a, an excellent tall tale. Then we will have questions and possibly truthful answers. All right, so what you see on the screen right now is the judges guide and ballot for the tall tales. Uh, if we can have Brandon post the link for this uh, ballot so that way you guys can access it also uh, online. Uh, what I would like to explain is on the left side, there are five different categories that the Tall Tale contestants are being judged on. The first category is speech development, where you are being judged on, on the speech organization. The second category is speech techniques, where you can showcase your humor, your exaggeration, and also show us some puns. Um, the next one is physical appearance, and body language. Then you are being judged on your volume, on your flexibility of your voice, on your vocal variety. And last but not least is the appropriateness. Are you using correct grammar? Are you using everything appropriate? Of course, no cuss words are allowed. Now, when you look at to the right, you see three different buckets. The first bucket is content. This bucket is related to the speech development and you have 30 points for this one. The second bucket is the delivery bucket. Here, it's a combination of the speech technique, physical and vocal variety. As you can see, this is the most important bucket because you can get 55 points for a successful delivery of your tall tale. And then we have the appropriateness. So you will have 15 points for using appropriate language. 
I hope you were able to get this. And if not, that's okay. We will learn along the way. So we would love for you to be judgmental tonight. And after each tall tale, we will encourage you to give us your vote and let us know what do you think about the tall tale and each of the categories. We will explain the, the poll as after each tall tale. All right, and now, my fellow Toastmasters and esteemed guests, it's time to introduce our first speaker, Evelyn Lee. Evelyn has placed twice at the District 57 Humorous Speech Contest. During two totals contests, she relished crushing her competitors and clamoring over their carcasses to take comment of the winner's platform. Evelyn also enjoys exaggeration. Now I will stop sharing and I will ask Evelyn to take the stage. Thank you, Jana. Good evening, all. Let's go back in time 200,000 years to the Middle Paleolithic era. Food was tough to come by. You were either running towards something to eat it or uh -oh, running away to avoid being eaten. The world back then was filled with ferocious beasts. Luckily, humans had learned to harness the power of fire and the families would build a campfire outside their huts so that the flames and the smoke would frighten away the wild animals. Except for one creature. One night a year in early winter, this creature would come creeping. It looked for the campfires. It hunted humans. It was Santa Claus. Now, as families huddled in their huts outside, Santa Claus would sniff the air, searching for the scent of humans who had been naughty because they were most delicious. And oh, how his eyes would twinkle as he caught the scent of a human who had been bad and gobbled them up. Archaeological evidence shows us that humans began to dig holes outside their huts next to the campfires and they would throw in treats trying to entice Santa Claus to fill up on nuts and berries rather than naughty humans. Santa savored these treats and as he went in search of the holes to get more, the people would hear him say, hole, hole, hole. Hum, 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 hum. Unfortunately, back then, Santa was still on the paleo diet, nuts, berries, and naughty humans. It would be many millennia more before humans finally invented the cookie. They took these sweet little biscuits and laid them out one night a year, hoping that that would protect them. And when Santa Claus came creeping, he went cuckoo for the cookies. He would stuff so many into his mouth and then run to the next hut and stuff more in and then dash off to the next hut. Well, what is it that mothers always warn during the holidays? If you're going to fill up on cookies, you're not going to have an appetite for anything else. And the people were saved. Hooray! Of course, hundreds of years of eating millions of cookies, that's terrible nutrition. And Santa Claus bones shrunk. His belly grew soft and round. And his claws peeled off. Ew, that's why we always see Santa wearing gloves today. The fellow bought himself a bright red suit and he looks the part of the jolly old elf we know. But I would warn all of you, remember to continue to be very good because you wouldn't want to tempt 
Santa Claus. Back to you, Yana. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Well, now before I make any comments, I would like everybody to judge Evelyn's, Evelyn's tall tale. So guys, what you can see right now on your screen uh, is a set of questions. So if you could please answer them. And it is definitely anonymous, so uh, you don't have to worry about answering this incorrectly. All right, Brendan, let us know if we can continue or if you need more people to vote. Uh, we still need quite a few more people to vote. So just want to give everybody another 10, 15 seconds to do that. Sounds good. All right, we got a good number. Last call, last call. All right, I'm going to end the poll and I will share the results. Evelyn, close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> wow, look at the look at that. So the speech technique was very good and the speech development was excellent. Wow. So, Evelyn since your speech development was absolutely excellent and on point, can you please tell us a little bit about, about your speech development? How did you develop your speech? Sure, thank you, Yana. When I was developing the story, it has much the same structure as any short story. You have an introduction. So I included a setting 200,000 years back in time. It also includes details about the characters, who are they, humans, and Santa Claus in this case, and also the dilemma, which was that Santa Claus was eating humans. The main body of the story, that's where I had fun. I used exaggeration to talk about how this huge Santa Claus was eating up people. And I also used exaggeration in my voice. So for example, when I was indicating that the, anytime I wanted to talk about Santa Claus, I would slow down and make my voice a little deeper. That makes a sense of drama. It creates a kind of creepy feel. And I would also try to direct my gaze directly into the camera to also connect with the audience and give them that, ooh. Santa Claus is coming. The other thing, once you have completed the body of the story, then of course is the conclusion. And I needed a way to triumph over the Santa Claus from the, prehis from the prehistoric version, came up with the cookie idea and nutrition, which helps to affect the way he looks and shrinks him down to who we know today. And if you intend to compete with a tall tale, try to see if you can include a call to action. So I tried to say, remember, continue to be very good. The one other tip I'm going to share with you or that I'd like to share with you regards staging. It's really difficult when we're just trying to tell a story in Zoom because it's so tiny, the, the area that we can move. The one thing I did consistently to help you recognize which character I'm talking about is whenever I talked about the humans, I made sure that it was a little bit over to my right or your left. I would, might come to the center, but I didn't cross the center. And anytime I was talking about Santa Claus, I would come over to my left or your right and have him look in the direction towards the humans. It's simple staging, but it can really help differentiate between characters. I would love to share many more tips, but we have additional storytellers tonight and they will also be sharing tips. 
So thank you for this opportunity to share my story with you. Back to you, Yana. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you so much. I definitely would love to give you a standing ovation <laughs> because this was so wonderful and the tips that you shared with everybody were super useful. So I hope that uh, people were able to, um, will be able to take it to their heart and implement them when they will be creating their tall tales. Very cool. So thank you, Evelyn. And I am going to call upon our next speaker, Declan Shelby. Declan is a two-time distinguished Toastmaster and a past winner of the Humorous Speech Contest in District 101. He reached the finals of Toll Tales in his first year in the Toastmasters, though the judges clearly made an error in not placing him among the winners. He aspires towards humility as those who care for him insist that there is so much for him to be humbled about. Please let me welcome Declan Shelby with his tall tale, My Streak of Good Luck. Toastmasters and guests, can you imagine removing all of your clothes and running naked in the downtown area where you live? If you can imagine that, you are a streaker. Now, perhaps many of you will remember streaking was a phase in Europe and in the US in the 70s. People would run naked in a public place on TV at games as a prank, as a dare, and sometimes as a protest. Let me tell you my story, as Yana says, titled My Streak of Good Luck. I returned to Dublin after working during the summertime when I was a student to begin my third year of engineering. My brother and two of our friends had just moved into a flat or an apartment. And was, as was our case back in the day, after any level of exertion, we adjourned to the pub. And after several pints of Guinness, somebody asked me, Declan, would you ever streak? And I thought about it and I said, well, yes, I would. If the rewards were commensurate with the risks. We agreed on one month's rent in the new flat for my streak. Back to the flat. I changed into my running gear. I stripped off. I'm not going to take off any more clothes because Yana will pull the plug on the Zoom call, got my running shoes. But let me tell you, if you're streaking in Ireland, wear some headgear because you never know when it might rain. Off I started on my run. I ran to the first junction. I wasn't sure of the area we had just moved in. I saw this older couple there out for an evening stroll. And I said, excuse me, sir, is this Cherrywood Avenue? The gentleman just cracked up. He could not stop laughing, but his wife was totally shocked. But then I noticed he became, he had a shortness of breath. He began to struggle to breathe and he fell to one knee. And I began to recognize the early onset of a heart attack. Then in my mind's eye, I saw the headline in the following day's paper, Hero Streaker Arrested, Saving Life of Aging Pensioner. I turned to his wife and I said, I think you should call 911. Off I went on my run again. The next junction brought me on to a very busy thoroughfare. I wove my way through the clouds, waving to all the observers, no time to stop for autographs. And then I heard the dreaded sound. Nino, 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 a police car was approaching at speed from the other direction. I sprinted to the next exit. But Irish people are wonderful, a lovely sense of civic pride, a great respect for the law. They all stepped in front of the police car to prevent him from following. But then, the policeman 
emerged from the car and I immediately recognized him. He was our Olympic sprinter. He had won the bronze medal in the 1972 Olympics and he was still in great shape. I turned that corner and I ran back to the apartment. I ran my best 400 meters ever. I came around that last corner expecting to see the welcoming faces of my brother and our two friends, but no, there were four young women waiting for me. While I went off on my sprint, my brother popped upstairs, invited these four young women down for what he called the evening show. I approached one of those young women, the prettiest one, carefully, and I said, a policeman is going to come around that corner in about one minute. Will you direct him down that alleyway towards the river? She said, I can do that. And then I asked her, would you consider going on a date with me tomorrow evening? She paused for a moment and said, in my experience, the date usually comes first. Then the subject of nudity comes up a little bit later. But I think your approach is very refreshing. And she said, yes, the following evening, Eleanor and I went on our very first date. And this year, we celebrated 40 years of marriage. Clearly, Toastmasters, my streak of good luck continues. Yana. Thank you, Declan. What a streak of good luck, definitely. Wow, thank you for your fantastic story. And as you guys can see, there is a judging form in front of you. So if you could please cast your vote. And of course, Brendan will let us know when the results are ready. We're getting a good chunk, but we still have some uh, hesitant judges out there. Maybe their eyes are burning. Uh, please, 15 more seconds for those reluctant judges. Um, Brendan, I'm trying to vote for the fifth time. Is that okay? <laughs> Early and often, as they do in Chicago. Right, I'm gonna close the poll now and share the results. I am so curious. How did you guys judge, De judge Declan? All right, so the re results are clear. The physical communication was excellent and your speech development was excellent. So congratulations, Declan. This story was absolutely entertaining. And could you please share with us a few tips and tricks how to prepare such a successful and entertaining story? Yana, there are three insight elements to this speech that I wanted to share with the audience. Now, the first was the opening. When I made that opening and said, well, could you imagine yourselves stripping off and running naked? I know a number of you were totally horrified. You couldn't believe this. You thought you were at the wrong meeting. A number of you, though, said, yeah, maybe if I had a couple of pints of that Guinness, I could do it. And some of you unfortunately imagined me doing it, and we won't talk about it. But the point more seriously about that opening was to grab your attention and transport you out of your thought processes you're having today to somewhere else. So a dramatic opening in the very first sentence was the key, up, first element. Yeah. Now, the second element that I want to bring to your attention is, believe it or not, in a three to five minute speech, there were three stories there. Me running towards that couple who had that pseudo heart attack. 
me running from that policeman and he chasing me and me running towards my future wife. But if you think about it, I used very few words in those speech elements, in those little stories. I allowed this audience to imagine it. Now I know you created that mental image of me running, of that older man struggling to breathe, of the people on the street stopping the police car, and me coming around that corner and seeing in surprise those four young women waiting for me. So the point here is I use very little words to tell the story, but I allowed the audience to imagine it, to fill in the blanks. So that's something to think about. Have you the courage to not give all the details, but allow the audience to create them? They become part of your story then. And the third element, which I think you've referenced in the, in the poll, Yana, was the physical movement. The physical movement was designed of course, in line with the content, running. And I was trying to convey the energy, but I was also trying to convey a little bit of the panic and the chaos as I was running through Dublin City. And particularly when the policeman arrived. So the physical move, I never said that I was stressed, I never said, but I conveyed that idea of, of chaos and high energy with the body movement. So those are the three elements, the opening, minimalistic stories and some body movement to complement uh, what you're what I was saying. Thank you, Declan. Well, I have to admit that your dramatic opening made me blush. And I think you guys can still see my face a little bit red, kind of trying to think what's going to happen because my imagination was going all over the place. So thank you so much for sharing this story. I hope everybody else got the excellent three points that you shared. And now we will transition to our next speaker. Our next speaker, speaker is Brandon James Murphy. He joined Toastmasters the last millennium. millennium. The sad thing is that he still has a lot to learn. He is a past district, district 57 table topics and humorous speech champion. And tonight he will humbly tell us the tall tale, how I save the world. Here is Brendan. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and welcome truth seekers. Have you ever, well, enough about you. Let's hear about me and the tall tree. The huge pine was on fire and shooting flames. It had to come down or else a huge conflagration would ensue. I immediately grabbed my equipment, the safety horn. It was my tough task to sit far away from the tree and wait until the tree started to fall and then sound my horn so that the person with the chainsaw would know that it's time to run away. Just as I got myself comfortable, my crew boss looked at me and said, Murphy, get over here. I was afraid because I was trained on chainsaws, but I was afraid of them. I only wanted to do the horn. He said, you're gonna cut down this tree. <laughs> Apparently, it wasn't a joke. Obviously, he didn't know I was from Palo Alto. A tree that is over 100 feet needs to be cut down by a professional lumberjack. A tree that is over 100 feet, five feet wide at the base, that can only be cut down by an idiot who should have been handing out Happy Meals at the drive through I had no time to debate, and worse, no time to whine. I immediately hugged the tree and looked up and walked around the circumference, judging in which direction the tree should fall. I grabbed my saw, started it, and started my front cut. 
Immediately in retribution, the tree sent down a five pound pine cone that knocked the hard half off of my head and made me work even harder to get this tree down. I then went around to start my back cut. And as I was doing so, the tree shot down embers onto my bare head. I certainly made time to whine. And just as I was whining, I had to enhance my whining because the wind pushed the tree back and it pinched my saw blade, making my saw useless. I quickly looked around and found a plastic wedge and was trying to put into a crevice amidst the smoke where I could knock in that wedge, which I should have done when I started my back cut. I kicked it in and that relieved just enough pressure for me to use my chainsaws once more. And I started to cut it as the sawdust around my feet started to flame. I heard my horn go off and I hot footed it out of there. As the tree fell down, I didn't see it. I was too busy running and running and screeching like a cat. That day, I did that one thing for the planet. But enough about me, let's talk about you. What is the one thing you can do to save our precious sphere? I should politely plead with you to do that thing, but this is a tall tale. I demand you do it. See, by making you do that one thing to save the environment, I, Brendan James Murphy, just saved the world. You're welcome very much. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Brendan, for saving the world and also for sharing this entertaining story with us. Now, everyone, if you could please cast your vote. Brendan will launch the polling soon. There you go. So we are looking at vocal communication and speech development. If there's any bad answers, I'll use my horn. For sure. I hope you have it ready. How there can be any good answers, Brandon. We have a good chunk, about 30 seconds left for polling. I'd love more people to participate. Another 10 seconds or so. Got a few judges out there who have not yet submitted their ballots. All righty, go ahead and end that poll here. Cool, and share the results. Am I seeing this correctly? Is it fair and fair? <laughs> oh, I guess not. It's uh, excellent for vocal communication and speech development, excellent. So Brandon, apparently you saved the world the right way. So now if you can please share some insights with us. Definitely. Uh, there were some things I was trying to do with this item. And uh, the first thing I wanted to do is add humor. I've told the true tale of this uh, true event. And I liked the experience I had, but it was so boring. It put the audience to sleep. So I was my attempt here was to add humor, especially at the beginning where I say, have have you ever asked the rhetorical question, then turn it around and then bring it back later. And that attempt at humor was also part of the twist. When you tell a, 
tell a tall tale. They want you to have a twist in there. So for me, the twist was the title, How I Saved the World. It wasn't by cutting down the tree. It was by getting you to do your one thing. And so that's the twist and that's interconnected with the humor. And it's also interconnected with what I think is an underutilized aspect of tall tales. I think tall tales can be learning devices as well. And that's what I was trying to get away, uh, get away with in this tall tale is encourage people to do one thing to save the environment and indeed save the world. So I believe I had a serious message that I was trying to do in an entertaining fashion. And that's what I was uh, working on and enjoyed the process. And I think the only problem was Dennis had some bad judging marks down here. I'll just delete those from the final results. Thank you, Matt. You're the one controlling this poll. You're the one who's got your fingers on the uh, controls there. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that there is some falsity going on with the results, and I am going to challenge them in court. Nice try, Bobolai. You go do your speaking. Yes, thank you so much. Um, OK, thank you, Brandon. This was wonderful. And um, of course, Dennis, you can always challenge Brandon's results and also ask Zoom to nego you know, to investigate, because they can see what happened in this call. So now, our our uh, last speaker for tonight is Dennis Dawson, who is a two-time distinguished Toastmaster. He said that he will continue to earn Toastmaster, distinguished, distinguished Toastmaster titles until he gets it right. Dennis is a past district champion in the humorous tall tales and evaluation contests. He often stands on street corners with his trophies and waits for people to ask about them. They don't. So with that, let me welcome Dennis Dawson. Fred is dead, the doctor said. The mourners crowded round the bed and hands were wrung and tears were shed. But Fred said, I, I don't think I'm dead. You're dead, all right, said Doc Malone. My tests and probes have clearly shown you have no pulse. Your life has flown. You're just a sack of blood and bone. At that, of course, the wife jumped in. And all Fred's friends and next of kin, which started such an awful din that Fred got up and poured a gin and tonic and turned on the set. He watched TV alone and let the others have their tete-a-tete -tete on whether he had died as yet. The row grew louder than before. The gin ran out, so out the door went Fred to a local store so he could buy himself some more. The sun that day was very hot. Long before the booze was bought, our hero had for begun to rot. The checker at the drugstore fought to smile and act like all was well, but found she simply couldn't quell her need to ask, phew. What in hell is giving off that awful smell? Fred looked around, but all the eyes had set on him, as had the flies. Fred lacked a method to disguise the smell one makes when someone dies. He bought the booze and sidled out, walked home with an air about him not unlike a weak old trout that's dorsal deep in sauerkraut. Fred walked into his home, and there he found that people weren't aware that he had been out anywhere. More than that, they didn't care. He packed his bag and down to drink, then moved out west to start a mink farm so that other folks would think the animals had caused his stink. He's dead there to this very day. And if you should be out that way, you might stop by his farm and say hello from 15 feet away. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you so much. So now everyone, I think many of you might be might have been surprised that Dennis tall tale was put in rhymes. And I'm curious how you will judge these tall tales. So please go ahead and um, cast your vote.
So there are definitely some funny comments coming up. For those who are not watching the chat, I encourage you to watch it because, of course, the exchange is very entertaining. Um, and if you could please cast your votes. Another 15 seconds, Madam Toastmaster. We have still some hesitant judges who are trying to get the uh, odor out of their nose. Okay, going to end that poll and share the results. Oh, look at that. What a surprise. The appropriateness of the language was excellent. And of course, the speech development was excellent. And what we learned that night is that Dennis Dawson is a poet. So thank you so much, Dennis, for sharing your fantastic tall tale. And if you could please share some insights with us. Well, I'll begin by saying this is a poem that I actually wrote 40 years ago. It was Thanksgiving 1982. And I remember because that was the first night that Eleanor saw me naked. But more than that, I wrote it in verse, as you noticed, yes, of course, it rhymed. That's a very tight rhyme, which is a little more difficult and not necessary in order to give you the benefit of memorization. I can recite that poem anytime I'd like, and this is what the ancient bards used to do. They used to tell their stories or really pass along news at the time, but they would do it in rhyme so it was easier for them to remember the the stories that they were telling. So uh, I strongly encourage you to try using rhyme and you don't even have to use rhyme for every line. What you can do is use rhyme in the introduction, in the conclusion, and in the transitions in between. Shakespeare used to do that as well. I like this story because it gives me a chance to play with some vocalization. There were definite characters that I wanted to portray and it didn't take a great deal of uh, uh, modification of my own voice to illustrate that this is the doctor talking, this is Fred and the checker, which were the only three characters who spoke in there. The story begins in medias race, that means in the middle of things. So I didn't spend a lot of time talking about how Fred had been sick for many years and all of his friends had come to his home expecting him to die that day or anything. I just go, Fred is dead. And uh, the interest that is sparked by that actually drives the story uh, very early on. Uh, Brent, I'm sorry, it was Declan who listened to my description of how the minimal detail enables you to paint the pictures yourself, stole all of my good points and expressed them about his story and so I will just say that I did what Declan did as well. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you so much. All of you, all of our speakers and trainers, I think you guys did such a fantastic job. And what I can say from the polls, from, from the result, and also from the chat that was running at, the, at all the time, all of you, all of you are absolutely amazing tall tales speakers. So now we are going to our next section in the agenda, and that is questions and answers. And you have all of us visible on the screen, so you are more than welcome to ask a question, and you can either direct it to one of us or whoever wants to speak up, they can answer your questions. So you can unmute yourself and ask a question, or if you don't feel comfortable, you can just place your question in a chat and we can, uh, I can just read it from the chat, whichever way works. Jim has a question. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Thank you for raising your head, go, uh, hand, <laughs> your head. <laughs> okay, thank I'm you, just, go ahead. I just figured out how to do that. I have a question for Declan's speech. Because to me, I, I always thought that tall tales was something with huge exaggeration, uh, things that are not believed, like Santa Claus, I get that. How is 
Declan's speech different to a humorous speech because everything that happened in Declan's speech could have happened in real life. People do run naked in the street. That's that's, that's very great. Uh, Declan, just uh, stop the time for a moment. Yes, it is an absolutely unbelievable exaggeration that a woman would see Declan naked and then marry him. Well, first of all, uh, Jim, I think your name is Jim, is that correct? I have an admission to make. I have never told a lie in my entire life. I am pathologically in, incapable of telling any lie or exaggerating. So you're very astute. But the complexity in my life is that in Ireland, there are so many versions of the truth, I just have to pick one. To your point, the story is authentic, but there are some exaggerations in there, Jim, let me assure you, but there is much truth. And of course, even a serious speech should have some humor to lighten. So it has those elements, but I'd love to tell you what was 100% true, but I will never tell you which parts are not true. And I, I think it's- I add, Sorry, I was gonna add one point, and that is if you're creating a tall tale, always try to include one or two facts, real facts, to help it seem a little more believable. You wouldn't want it to be completely fantastical because then it's not really a tall tale, it's a fantasy. So in mine, I talked about archeological evidence and going back to the middle paleolithic era. Those are things that sound real and help give the story a, a sense of Maybe this could have happened. Yeah, you want to start with normal and then tweak something. Now, the story that I told was actually uh, suggested by a coworker when I was a tour guide. He was 70 years old and he was this really energetic guy. And someone said, he's going to be rolling in his coffin six weeks after he's dead. And I just wrote that down. I thought that was a, a funny uh, thing for someone to say. And when I was sitting around on Thanksgiving, I just happened to uh, uh, read that and it sparked the poem at that point. But uh, when we say Fred is dead, perfectly normal for someone to die in bed. And then I said, but he's not dead. How is that going to impact his life? What's it going to be like walking around in the world? How uh, is that going to, uh, how is the world going to impact him? And that's really all you have to do. Start with normal, exaggerate one thing, and then ask yourself, what is the impact of that going to be on the world around him? And you're, you've got your story right there. Jim, do you have any follow-up questions or are you pretty okay with the answers? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Do we have anybody else who would like to ask? Wendy has a question. Okay, Wendy, go ahead. Thank you. Hi. Um, I think definitely I have, I, uh, have a question for every speaker because for me, absolutely, I cannot see it. The idea. I think that uh, uh, Dennis just explained how he got the idea, and Declan, you know, I so relating to the same question. You said that you could tell us what what is true, right, about your story, or how how did you get the idea in the first place? Like flash through, you know, you got this idea. The element of streaking and running through Dublin is true. Wendy, all I had to do was remember it. And I think the, the point is, apart from the specifics of my story, the best speeches, whether humorous tall tales or international, start with some authentic 
experience. And what that does for me, actually, when I tell this story, Wendy, I relive that run. And it feels fresh to me. I don't have to remember the words. I don't have to remember. I can see the people in the corners. I remember the police car. So it's, it's a true story. And um, that, that's where I always start with my speeches, Wendy. That's, thank you, Declan, super helpful because what you said is start with something, relive it and connect the dots, right? Like fragments, you know, in, in your memory. Um, yeah, See, thank you. It doesn't actually have to be a huge moment in your life. Uh, Wendy, what did you have for breakfast this morning? I had a, a bun, Chinese <laughs> a sweet bun. <laughs> uh, sweet bun. And what was inside of it? What could have been inside of it? It could have been a dinosaur egg inside your sweet bun. Well, if a dinosaur starts hatching out of your breakfast, what are you going to do? Story. Awesome. Yeah, I, I felt I, I try, I have, even I had some outrageous experience, but somehow I feel like my imagination cannot even walk, let alone run, you know, but you just showed me how to do that. Thank you. And also the ghost story, I, I noticed that you and Declan use the same, you mentioned, I, I, I completely can see that because both of you do not describe like how Fred looks or how Declan, you know, the details, you don't have details, but you keep telling the actions to let us imagine. And the, I realized when I was hearing your story, I realized there are a lot of ghost stories, even in the movies, right? But I was thinking, was Fred visible or not visible? Because a lot of ghosts were not visible, right? But in your story, he is visible. Yeah, that's yes. the difference. But, yeah, yeah, it's uh, the only thing I describe about Fred is his smell. And even then, it's uh, a visualization of how he smells. So, uh, it, it, yes, <laughs> Karen got that immediately. Yeah, so it's it's interesting that the less detail we give, the more vivid the pictures can be in the uh, minds of our audience. If we're going to go into a lot of detail, it uh, is going to take away from the story telling. So uh, it has to be very important to the story. Uh, it's, uh, oh, somebody's gun, somebody's gun. If you put a, uh, a detail into a story, ah, like it's a- Chekhov's gun. Chekhov's gun, thank you, thank you. Uh, Chekhov's gun, if, if there is a gun on the wall in, in the play, that gun has to be shot sometime during the play. If anybody references the gun, it has to be shot during the play. If you're not gonna shoot the gun, don't make any reference to it. Don't include it in the story. Don't include any detail that's not going to show up later and move the story forward. So if you uh, keep it spare, let the, people create the world for themselves in their own minds. Yes, super helpful. Thank you, all of the speakers, because this really gave us room to imagine. <laughs> now our brain is active. <laughs> Thank you so well, much. Uh, Anita is exactly right. Think like a child. And again, this is a, a Greek philosopher, but there is nothing, uh, no time when we are more authentic than a child at play. And if you can give yourself the freedom to just have fun, to say something completely stupid, something completely silly, that is very often the seed to a wonderful story. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. I definitely also share that sentiment that thinking like a child is probably the best bet for any tall tale. Awesome. So Wendy, thanks for asking all these great questions. And I see that Jim raised his hand. So Jim, go ahead. My question is about, uh, do the same rules apply about jargon and specialist terms? Because I noticed in two of the speeches, there were some specialist terms. Uh, for example, Brendan talked suddenly about a wedge. He had to put a wedge into the tree somehow. And I suppose that presupposes that I know how people cut down trees. 
And the other one was about the dinosaur in the paleo something or other era. Uh, although I did see the development of that speech, and I thought that was very clever because then the dinosaur, the uh, Santa Claus, uh, was on the paleo diet. So, you know, that clicked for me right away. But the wedge in the tree and other things, do the same rules apply? That's a good point. You know, the, the idea is, does it communicate or not? And I was hoping to communicate that with gestures and, and you know, kicking it in. So, uh, you know, again, uh, it sounds like it didn't work with the gestures and everything like that. But the idea was to put some force to allow the blade to be free. So that's that's good feedback. Thank you. Well, on the, on the judging form, when they talk about appropriate language, jargon would come into play. So if you're talking to a bunch of plumbers and you say, this guy showed up with a four inch Flexstar wrench, I couldn't believe it. And the whole audience erupts in laughter. You're appropriate for the audience, but nobody else is going to get that. So choose language that everyone will understand. If you start using Toastmasters jargon in the middle of a, a tall tale told before Toastmasters, uh, that's going to come across just fine. But I interrupted Declan because he was going to say something silly. So <laughs> thank you, Dennis. Jim, my, my thought on this, and it's actually beyond the con beyond the construct of a tall tales speech. It's about every speech. And that is I stay away from any jargon or anything that's specific like that, that that you need a background to understand or some familiarity. Because I believe what happens in that instant is that the listener says, oh my goodness, they think, what, is, what does wedge mean? What is backdraft or whatever that term was? What does that mean? They stop listening to you for one or two seconds. You have moved on and the audience has to catch up. So I think that's what we should try and avoid at all costs. Don't introduce a term that might cause the listener to be distracted or confused. That's my rule in any speech. And I was almost tempted earlier to describe what naked means uh, to Evelyn, but you know, I was a little bit worried if, she, if, if I would lose her, but I chose not to. I thought perhaps she had some perspective on that. Evelyn has read about nudity in books. So I think she's got covered. Thanks, back to you, Johanna. Thank you, thank you, Jim. I do see that we have another uh, esteemed guest that Anita brought with her, a cute little kitty cat. <laughs> so um, does anybody have any other questions? No question, but may I just add a comment? Uh, jargon in relation to a gun hanging on the wall. If you're not going to explain it or if it needs to be explained, don't use it. Well, That's there, are, there are times if you're telling the story of the moose turd pie, a big part of that story is explaining what a Gandhi dancer is. So he, he spends some time talking about the fact that he, as a Gandhi dancer, he would ride out on the trains and when the uh, rails were uneven, he would take out his shovel, which was made by the Gandhi company. He would stick the shovel under the rail and then he'd jump up and down on the handle, in effect, doing a Gandhi dance up there and that's what would settle the rail so in a case like that explaining the term adds some charm to the story so that would be okay but don't you uh, don't say well i was a gandy dancer and you know what that means <laughs> and go on because you've just lost the entire audience thank you thank you anita for the comment all right, anybody else? Questions, comments, feedback, anything that comes to your mind, please share. Jim has a question. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Jim. I was wondering what the meta message is when they set three to five minutes as the tall tale 
speech versus a five to seven minutes uh, length for normal speeches? I think it comes down to the fact that if you're, if it's a really crazy exaggerated story, three to five minutes is the max that people can put up with. <laughs> five to seven of you like, when is this thing gonna end? So I think it has something to do with the fact that it's very exaggerated. I think there's also an element, Jim, that you know, we're set a challenge to entertain to exaggerate, to be ridiculous in a short period of time. And, you know, I used to, I remember working with somebody at work and I, I asked them for a report and they gave me 10 pages. And I said, well, what's all this about? And he said, if I had time, I'd give you one page, but I don't, so here's 10. So, so the point is that the brevity factor makes you work, I think, a little bit harder on these speeches, and I love that. Also, there are many Toastmasters who love to tell a tale. Well, you know, I had to go to Shelbyville, and we wore an onion on our belt. That was the style in those days, and I, you know, and, uh, the story goes off in all kinds of directions. So uh, just to keep people's sanity, I think we want to avoid giving Toastmasters any more time and they absolutely need to tell the story properly. Otherwise, they're going to fill it with a bunch of diversions and digressions. Someone asked here awesome. how much truth, oh, sorry, uh, Melanie had asked how much truth and how much fiction do you include? I think Dennis touched on it. Begin your story truthfully with some facts or it seems like a real situation. Then it gets crazy. In the middle of the crazy, try to include maybe one more thing that's factual to balance it and then continue on with exaggeration. The story should also return to normal at the end in most cases. If it doesn't, you have to describe the new normal and how this has changed your life forever or how the world was changed forever. Melanie, I hope we answered your questions. Uh, anybody else? Okay, Melanie says thanks. So Evelyn and uh, Dennis, thank you. All right, anybody else? You can raise your hand, you can post your question in a chat or you can just unmute yourself. Dennis, I have a question for you. Do you still use rhyming to help you remember things in your daily life now that you have become ancient? Or give us a perspective on that, please. Oh, absolutely. Remove my toothbrush from my sheath. Now I use to brush my teeth. Yeah, otherwise I would forget to brush them. Take your pills to end your ills. Uh, <laughs> Don't act like a banker. You're just a silly. Oh, I can't remember how that one ends. No, no let's not go with that one, uh, please, uh, Dennis. Okay. <laughs> All right. I see that Vivian raised her hand. Let Vivian go ahead. Yes. Have you have you ever had somebody tell an entire story that was one hundred percent lie, but claimed? that one part of it was truth. <laughs> Did he get away with it? Let me know. I, I think you're asking, is anyone married? And the answer is uh, yes, many of us are. So yes, we have heard <laughs> things, complete lies. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. I love you for your honesty. Is your wife in the room? Let me talk to her. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, actually, she, she's right. She's right here. I'll, I'll get her in a moment. One second. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. But really, has awesome. anyone ever done, really, Yana, has anyone ever done 100% lie, but was able to convince the audience that one part of it was truth? Just curious. Well, I'll tell you, 
it doesn't happen in tall tales, but I know that it happens in the ISC, the International Speech Contest. We've had several winners who tell heartbreaking uh, stories of illnesses of relatives, et cetera. And then when asked about it later, they're composite stories. So. Oh my. Thanks for the info. Thank you. I know we have some other hands, but there's some questions in the chat. I just wanted to see if we can get those. Yana, did you see those? One from Melanie and one from Kieran? Yeah, so from Melanie, uh, we already answered that one. And Kieran was asking, is it okay to introduce time travel related stories? I would like to take that one where we went back in time 200,000 years. If you're talking about a story about yourself and you go back in time or forward in time, just remember that you have to express how do you in your current form feel about that to make it seem like it's possible. And then yeah, as Dennis I, said, at the yeah. conclusion, come back to current time. And I would say time travel is the only place, uh, a tall tale is the only place for time travel because I hate time travel as a plot device, but in a tall tale, it's so ridiculous anyway, it kind of makes sense. Uh, so uh, maybe this is the one place I would use it if ever. I'll tell you the one yeah, kind sounds... of story you are never allowed mm -hmm. to tell. Never tell a story where you say, and then I woke up. Uh, yeah. that, oh, that, that is terrible. It's a terrible way to end a story. It's an, uh, a cowardly way to end a story. Go ahead and go for it. Uh, tell that lie and stand by it. But uh, the, the, it was all a dream stuff that is a completely washed out trope. Don't, don't try and use that. Thank you, Dennis. That's a good insight. So I see that Jim raised his hand. So go ahead, Jim. And after that, I will ask, uh, I know Michael posted something in the chat. So we'll go to Michael's question next. Dennis, how would I get started in trying to get a rhyming thing going? Uh, what resources can you suggest? Uh, there are rhyming dictionaries available online. Uh, and there are words that are easy to rhyme and words that aren't. Uh, so don't end lines with words like orange, because uh, I think I rhymed that with storage or silver and rhyme that with quiver. Now, in these current times of rap, uh, slant rhymes like that uh, can you, you can get away with them. Uh, but if you if you don't use pure rhymes, to always remember that it has to have assonance. It has to sound nice. The words have to sound uh, work well together. And even if you don't have meter the way I did, tum to tum to tum to tum, you have to have rhythm, tum to tum 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 to tum tum tum, in order for it to be effective. That's why some rap music is just fantastic to listen to, and others uh, uh, they leave me completely empty because it doesn't have assonance, the words don't fit well together, and the rhythm doesn't work. Nice. Thanks. After this meeting, everybody will go and listen to some rap music. Awesome. All right. So we have a question from Michael in the chat. What consideration do you take and what methods do you use when you weave other real people in your tall tale? Who would I like think, to take this question? I think the power of bringing another character in is that it allows the character, the other person, to say something that you, the storyteller, or the or think of yourself as a narrator, cannot say. I used that technique just one time in, in this speech that I gave tonight, where when I, I talked to this beautiful young woman, and she said, and I said, Will you go for a date? And she paused. She said, she said, what she said was something that I couldn't say. She said, I, in my experience, the date comes first. 
and nudity comes later, the subject of nudity comes later, I find your approach refreshing. So it allowed me to bring in that different perspective on the situation I was in. So that's the power of bringing in those characters, creating the dialogue to essentially say something that you, the storyteller, cannot. If you, the storyteller, can say it and the person says it, it doesn't have that punch. So that's the considerations that I think about. Can they say something ridiculous, funny, that I cannot? Now, if you include real people in your story, you, of course, don't want to name them if there's anything at all that they might find offensive. But if you change the name, they will never recognize any negative qualities that you attribute to a character in themselves. So you're perfectly safe. And, and I think we all know the power of self-deprecating humor. I remember reading about that one somewhere. I'm not sure where. But when you bring in another character, you can, you can have them make fun of you, the storyteller, the narrator. So that's a powerful technique to lighten the mood and get people on your side. In some ways, you can become a little bit of a victim and who knows, you might even be likable by the time the seven minute window is up or five minutes in total. Thank you, Declan and Dennis, for your insights. I see that Vivian raised her hand. Go ahead, Vivian. Yes, these people in this room are just doing strange things to my mind. I was just thinking, would it not be a whole new market for Toastmasters to invite lawyers and their clients to learn tall tales and storytelling, because as Dennis said in the chat a while ago, never let the truth interfere with a good story. I think we have a new market, lawyers and guilty clients. What do you think? V Vivian, <laughs> I don't know you know, but that's it's mandatory in law school that they learn to tell tall tales. They're very good Vivian, at it. That is true. You do have courtroom drama. You're absolutely right. But seriously, this, this trick might just expand its market. <laughs> just a well, thought. What, what you find very often is there's uh, nothing less reliable than eyewitness testimony. You can have four people right on the scene who witness uh, a crime or other activity, and you're going to get four different stories, four different points of view on that. Because the truth is, uh, we can't know what the truth is. All we can know is what we sense, what we visualize out there. And so uh, there, there is no single truth, even if four people are looking at exactly the same thing. And everyone's yeah, everyone's going to choose the truth that yeah. uh, helps their particular case. Uh, and in terms of telling stories uh, that you want to import uh, some kind of important information, you don't want to go for a tall tale because a tall tale is obviously ridiculously fictionalized, exaggerated. But the narrative, telling a story, a narrative where you're not focused on the details or the facts, but you're telling the overall truth, I think that's a different approach than tall tales. So definitely you would want. Uh, you know, people to tell their narrative in a situation. Yeah, I think even in a court case, you know, to say, hey, here is my perspective, as Dennis mentioned, here's what I saw, what I heard, what I felt, and not trying to pass that off as the ultimate truth, but sharing my narrative. Yeah, an excellent resource for telling true stories about your life. Well, first of all, there's a uh, uh, story worthy is a great book by uh, one of the winners of the Moth uh, Story Slams. But another one is Stories That Stick. This is more for marketing people. And you, she is really good at helping you fashion a story quickly that's going to help get your point across. And her simple formula, you start with describing the normal, you describe one uh, catalytic event, event that changes everything, and then you describe the new normal. So it's one, two, three, uh, stories that stick. Excellent book, highly recommended. Thank you. Oh, 
Yes, thank you. And thank you, Vivian, for asking. Looks like we have time for one last question. One last question for tonight. Who wants to take it? I'll ask. Okay, it looks would... like Anita. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, tell me, is it is it not vital that you remember, not remember, that you believe the story you're telling? Yes, absolutely. You have to believe it. You have to visualize it yourself as you're telling the story. If you can't picture it uh, yourself, then it, no one else is going to pick it up either. I make a make a larger point about this when I'm actually doing a, a live workshop, because very often I'll have someone in, uh, doing a, a mime. So they're pretending that they're getting into the bathtub, etc. When I tell them to step into the bathtub, everybody raises their leg very high to get into the bathtub. And then I say, oh no, you've got to get out of there quickly. And they forget. And everybody who's watching them tell the story knows that they would trip as they were running away. And so right. you have to visualize it so you remember to step over that thing. And when you have it visualized to that extent, the audience sees you doing it and they uh, go along with your gestures and they're more likely to believe the story along with you. But there's there's more of a risk of taking them out of the story than sucking them in by uh, it, if you accidentally do something that uh, destroys your visual picture that you've created for them. Mm -hmm. Maybe another thought on Anita's question. Um, you know, I use the, the language that says st stories should be authentic, some basis in your reality and in your experience, because when you tell that story, it becomes alive again, you're reliving it, and there, uh, and you're connecting then with your audience, because, you know, it, there's a transparency about authenticity. But I say you can make an, uh, you can have an authentic story that is not 100% accurate, Anita. So maybe, you know, you spin some element for humor, for entertainment, mm -hmm. but you're not drifting far away from the core. So, right. so I think it's that element that for me is important with storytelling. Yes, you can stray a little bit, but come back. I don't know if that helps, but that's what I thought I heard in your question. Or well, that's your question inspired that thought in me, I should say. Thank you. So thank you to all of you for coming. I hope you were entertained and I hope you did learn something today that will help you along the way, writing and demonstrating successful tall tales. With this, I will give the word back to our host, Abby. Thank you so much, Yana. Thank you for keeping all these Irishmen and Evelyn in check. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, Declan. Thank you, Brendan. And thank you, Dennis. We really enjoyed it. And thank you for adding value to our lives. And everyone, please join us again on December 15th. We have a special event. Connecting with others, Ramesh, who is a leadership coach, is going to give that session. Thank you so much, and we'll see you again on the 15th of next week, actually, 15th of this month. Have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>